progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we come together today, shall we not praise our Heavenly Father for the blessings of this prior week and for the opportunity that we have to open his word to learn that which he would have us to understand? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these Sabbath hours. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word, to learn that which you would have us to understand at this time. As we open the words of your prophets, we ask today that our minds might be enlightened so that we may see that which you would have us to understand. Direct us now as we join together. We thank you for this opportunity because as we join together, where two or three are gathered together, there you will be also. We welcome you. We welcome your spirit. We welcome your guidance. We ask for your angels. Be around us, each one. Direct us so that we may more clearly understand that which you would have us to accept at this time, so that we might more directly be able to give the message that you would have us to give to this world in its last minutes. Be with us now. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. There are several things that we're going to cover this morning. Part of this is going to be a recap. Part of this is going to be a deeper dive into exactly what the Lord is telling us in the book of Zephaniah. So as we begin... The word of the Lord, which came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of, son of Hizkiah, and the Jays of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. So, in the days of Josiah, places this book being when? Approximately be, between what years? Well, it's uh, Josiah reigned for 31 years, and his reign ended in uh, 709 BC. Okay. So his reign ended roughly 102 years prior to Daniel and his friends being taken into captivity. Well, 609, pardon me. 609. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew I was saying something wrong. But I couldn't figure out what I said. Yeah, 609. So so Josiah's reign ended um, at the start of the 70 years for Babylon. That is, Assyria falls in October of 609, and Babylon then becomes the, the ruling power in the Levant. Okay. By taking away, I will make an end from off the face of the land, saith the Lord. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. Can there be any other fearful statement that could come to a people at this time? God is going to take away all things from off the land. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the idols with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. Any kind of idolatry. 
is going to be consumed. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Kimarans with the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and that swear to the Lord and that swear by Malcolm. Or Molech. Or Molech. To touch on a current situation. And them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear to the Lord, and that swear. of the need of sacrificing children. God is being very direct here because Molech is yet being worshiped. Yeah. And just to comment here on the, the Hebrew in that it says to the Lord, that's the Lamed in front of Yahweh. Okay. It means against, and then uh, in the the word Malcolm, the the prefix there is the bet instead of the lamed, so it's not the L sound, it's the B sound, and that means uh, by Malcolm. So they're swearing against the Lord, but by Malcolm. Well, whenever we are not keeping God's law. Mm -hmm. is that not the same as what we're talking about right here mm -hmm. and them that are turned back from the lord and those that have not sought the lord no nor inquired for him oh i all i need is what my pastor tells me all I need is what my church tells me. All I need is what my priest tells me. I don't need to read this because the leaders of my church have the time to read this and tell me what the Bible says. Just get me on the mountaintop. Okay. So people say, just get me on the mountaintop. That's all I care about. <laughs> well... <clears throat> I've attended meetings where I've had to listen to, to men state that they don't have the time to study their Bible. All they need to do is accept what their leaders are telling them because they have the time to study. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath sanctified, or he has prepared his guests. We're not talking about this in the Calvinistic way. If we are not willing to accept the robe of Christ's righteousness, if we are not coming to this righteousness by faith, we are not prepared. If we have not accepted the third angel's message in its entirety and in its truth, we are not prepared. And I shall come to pass and it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes. I will visit upon the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. What strange apparel are they clothed in?
Well, their own righteousness, I would say. Okay. <clears throat> In the example of Achan, what was the apparel that Achan sought to retain? Was it not a Babylonish garment? <clears throat> Is that also not strange apparel before God? Yes, yes. <clears throat> In the same day also, I will punish all those that leap upon the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be a noise in the house of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. Howl, ye inhabitants of Moktesh, for all the merchant people are cut down all they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are thickened upon their leaves that, I, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore, their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but shall not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. What symbol are the fenced cities? What symbol are the high towers? Symbolically, what is the trumpet being blown against? What warning is befalling us? Thinking of the trumpet powers, the wool, wool trumpet. I'm looking at the fenced cities and the high towers in a different manner. That's be church and state, the union of church and state. I would think so. Okay. From, as we're coming to this. From the chat, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fence cities and against the high towers. Combined, we come up with a number of 1863. Does 1863 have any meaning? to us. And I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them as the day of the Lord's wrath. 
but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. How are we to see this, brothers and sisters, at this time? How are we to approach this? Now, <clears throat> we're going to go back into some passages written by Sister White. I've got a passage that I'm going to read before we review this portion. God holds his people as a body responsible for sins existing in individuals among them. If there is a neglect with the leaders of the church to diligently search out the sins which bring the displeasure of God upon his people as a body, they become responsible for these sins. I have a hard enough time being responsible for the very sins that I've allowed into my life. I have no interest in being responsible for someone else's sins. How do you feel about that? But this is the nicest work that men ever engaged in, to deal with minds. All are not fitted to correct the erring. They have not wisdom to deal justly while loving mercy. For those that choose to reject a message, for those that choose to believe that chronology and numbers have no place within this message and within this movement. Those are choosing to stand against Palmoni himself. When you stand against Christ, who are you standing with? It can only be Satan. Is that where you wish to stand? Is that where any of us wish to be standing at this time? They will not be inclined to see the necessity of mingling love and tender compassion with faithful reproof of wrongs. Some will ever be needlessly severe and will not feel the necessity of the injunction of the apostle. And if some have compassion, making a difference and others with fear, pulling them out of the fire. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we are not here to cast others out. That is not our job today. We have a choice. We have to look to Christ to let him winnow out the tares from the wheat. It is not our job to decide who is a tear and who is wheat. It is not our job to decide to cast out others. Those that make those type of decisions are choosing to stand against Christ directly.
God will not be trifled with. It is in time of conflict when the true colors should be flung to the breeze. It is then the standard bearers need to be firm and let their true position be known. It is then the skill of every true soldier for the right is tested. Shirks, those that avoid the work can never wear the laurels of victory. Those who are true and loyal will not conceal the fact, but will put heart and might into the work and venture their all in the struggle. Let the battle turn as it will. God is a sin-hating God. And those who will encourage the sinner, saying, it is well with thee, God will curse. How many of us wish to be cursed of God? We compare this from Review and Herald, June 8th, 1886. With Great Controversy 88. When the Savior pointed out to his followers the sign of his return, he foretold the state of backsliding that would exist just prior to his second advent. There have been signs. There have been earthquakes. There have been dark days. There have been falling stars. The state of backsliding that would occur just prior to his second advent is yet another warning sign. There would be, as in the days of Noah, the activity and stir of worldly business and pleasure seeking, buying, selling, planting, building, marrying, and giving in marriage with forgetfulness of God and the future life. For those living at this time, Christ's admonition is, take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unaware. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, verses 34 and 36. The condition of the church at this time is pointed out in the Savior's words in the Revelation. Thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Revelation 3, 1 and 3. And to those who refuse to arouse from their careless security, the solemn warning is addressed. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation 3, 1 and 3. As we addressed last evening, what church is being referenced here? Or the house of the Lord, I would say. I would say. Okay. The Church of Sardis. It's the sixth Sardis. Sixth. 
I thought it was the fifth. Okay, you're probably right, Dwight. Because it's Sardis, Philadelphia, <clears throat> and then Laodicea, right? Correct. And Laodicea is the seventh church, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, why would Mrs. White, in these two paragraphs, choose to use passages where she skips a verse consecutively? What is it about Luke 21, 34 to 36, that she is not saying about verse 35? And what is she not saying about verse 2 in Revelation 3? Can someone read Luke 21, 34 to 36, please? And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. So she's giving a warning of a snare, a trap. We are to watch so that we don't fall into the trap. Would that be a fair comment? Well, you're asking why she left that verse out about the snare. Correct. So I'm not sure why she left it out necessarily. Is not this entirety of this passage a warning to us today? Yeah. So we're to watch that we don't fall into the snare. Mm -hmm. Can someone else please read Revelation 3, 1 through 3? And unto, sorry. Go ahead. And unto the angel of the church, church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are, that are ready to die. For I, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, thou hast how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon, I will come upon thee. What is the active word in the admonition to Sardis? Watch. What about repent? Sorry. Now from, from the chat, wasn't snare the meaning of Kishon, where Elijah killed the false prophets? I don't think so. Okay. It meant winding. Um, so I guess sort of indirectly, maybe. It means bend to set a trap or lay a snare. Yeah, so that is correct. We have been looking at Keyshawn in our studies in the book of Judges. The reference here is regarding the brook, Kishon, rather than the river. Mm -hmm. Here, 
Sardis is being told to repent. Sardis is warned not to fall into the trap of those around them, but is being told to repent. Is that not where we are at today? Do we not see our great need of repentance? Through repentance, we need um, a John. Go ahead. As I was say, we need a John the Baptist message. Is that not what we're addressing right now in the book of Zephaniah? Yep. Yep. Through repentance comes unity. When the disciples went to the upper room after Christ had ascended, what work occurred in that upper room? Did they not pray together? Did they not confess their sins to one another? Did they not repent and come into unity? You cannot have an upper room experience with those that are willing to assume that they have the work to cast others out. And to pick and choose, pick and choose what character they like and what character they don't like. Agreed. And to pick and choose what message they will accept. Do we have the wisdom to set aside any message that is presented from Scripture? Are we not? to compare line upon line the messages that are found to determine those messages and their relevance for our time? Consider this carefully, brothers and sisters. We cannot afford to fall into a snare. We cannot afford to think as the world thinks. Our mind and our home is not here. It was needful that men should be awakened to their danger, that they should be roused to prepare for the solemn events connected with the close of probation. The prophet of God declares, the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Joel 2.11. It was interesting to me last night, we were dealing with 3.11, with 4.11, and 9.11. Who shall stand when he appeareth, who is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity? Habakkuk 1.13. The reverse of 3.11. To them that cry, my God, we know thee, yet have transgressed his covenant, and have hastened after another God. Hosea. 8.2 and 1, Psalm 16.4, hiding iniquity in their hearts and loving the paths of unrighteousness. To these, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it. Amos 5.20. It shall come to pass at that time, saith the Lord, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees and say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. 
Zephaniah 1.12. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay the haughtiness, lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Isaiah 13, 11. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. Zephaniah 1, 18 and Zephaniah 1, 13. Mrs. White is being very clear. She is taking portions of this book of Zephaniah that we are studying. She is placing the verses to give us a very dramatic and direct message. The prophet Jeremiah, looking forward to this fearful time, exclaimed, I am pained at my very heart. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, destruction upon destruction is cried. Jeremiah 4, 19 and 20. So if destruction upon destruction is cried, is this not a, a, a form of a doubling? Is this not showing the need for us to understand the first, the second, and the third angel's message? It's not all about just giving the message. We need to be able to understand it, to be able to give an answer for the message as well. Many churches today would set aside the warnings of Revelation 14. Too many times, the churches that would set it aside are those that should understand it the best. <clears throat> that day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm, Zephaniah 1, 15 and 16. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it, Isaiah 13, 9. Isn't it interesting that this warning from Isaiah 13, 9 can be reconfigured to 391. Is this not a message for our time today? Now, Manuscript 7, 1891, Christian service in the living church. Portions of this manuscript are published in 4 BC, 1159, Evangelism 338, Today with God 170, 6 MR 6566, 9 MR, 158 and 375. This was written the 10th of June, 1891. For those that believe that all of Mrs. White's writings have been released, I direct you to the note that you will find on many of her documents. This note makes it very clear 
that they have yet to be fully released. Because as the note reads, one or more typed copies of this document contain additional Ellen White handwritten interlineations, which may be viewed at the main office of the Ellen G. White estate. How many of us today have the time or the resources to go look at each of these documents? How many of us would be allowed in to look at each of these documents? What are God's plans and purposes concerning us? Christ, the world's redeemer, was God in human flesh. He was the majesty of heaven, the king of glory. He was the greatest teacher the world ever knew. Tender, compassionate, sympathetic, ever considerate for others. He represented the character of God and was constantly engaged in service for God. And as Jesus was in human nature, so God means his followers to be. When we rise above this earthly atmosphere and look into the face of Jesus Christ, we see God revealed in his character. Go ahead, please. Are we not to reflect Christ's character in everything that we do? Mm -hmm. How can we reflect Christ's character if we're choosing to throw people out and not allow them to speak? Well, it's even more than just that. It's, are we going to know the truth unless we examine it. Amen. How can we examine the truth if we are unwilling to follow Miller's rules? Mm -hmm. Are we to accept the word of man? as our rule of faith or the word of God. Well, the thing is, we act just like the church that we criticize. We treat, we treat people actually worse than the Adventist church treated us. Is that what we're to be doing? That's a simple question. Is this the way we are to be acting? No. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, this is not just a conversation between two friends. This is meant for us to consider these items, to respond, to examine them fully for ourselves and for ourselves to place ourselves on the record. Christ was meek and lowly. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He did not return the same attitude to those that chose to accuse him. But he was very severe when sin and deception and hypocrisy were manifested by the scribes and the Pharisees. From his lips came the most terrible denunciations against the pretended piety with which they covered up their hypocrisy. 
their unjust dealing, and their inhumanity to their fellow men. How did Christ approach things when he came into the temple at the outset and the close of his ministry? Did he give a terrible denunciation at that time with, at, in any manner? I believe scripture shows that he had a whip of cords. He went through and he cleansed the temple. He drove out the money changers. He ended the buying and the selling not with words, but with actions. How are we to act today? Have we driven out the money changers, the greed, and the issues within our own lives? Are we not to be the living blocks of the heavenly temple? How can we be thus if we are not driving out the sin that is within our own lives? Is this not first a personal work before it becomes a corporate work? The meek and lowly one read the sentiments of every heart. He is a perfect savior. On special occasions, when he saw the deceptions, which by Satan's suggestions were leading men from light and truth into darkness, when he saw men under Satan's diction, dictation, fighting against omnipotence, divinity flashed through humanity, and as a judge, he pronounced the condemnation of the wrongdoers. The light of his divinity flashed about him, and many of the people who heard his words believed. There was no guile on his lips, and the words he spoke came to pass in terrible judgments which fell upon the Jewish nation. I fear for those that would choose to abandon studying with others because they preferred to cast them out because they did not understand the message. I fear for those that are choosing darkness over light. I fear for those that are choosing to accept the way of the world rather than the way of Christ. Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. And cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Moab hath been at ease from his youth. And he that settled upon his lees and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither hath he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remaineth in him and his scent is not changed. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send unto him wanderers and shall cause him to wander and shall empty his vessels and break their bottles. Jeremiah 48, 10 through 12. 
and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leads, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Zephaniah 1, 12 to 14. Curse ye, Maraz, saith the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to, to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Judges 5.23. This description of Moab represents the churches that have become like Moab. It is not saying this is the description of the churches that have become like Babylon. They have become like Moab. <clears throat> they have not stood at their post of duty as faithful sentinels. They have not cooperated with the heavenly intelligences by exercising their God-given ability to do the will of God pressing back the powers of darkness and using every power God give, has given them to advance truth and righteousness in our world. They have a knowledge of the truth, but they have not practiced what they know. The pastors and elders have not advanced in zeal, and the churches are what? The churches are dead spiritually. They are as salt without the virtue, the saving properties which salt is supposed to have. This cold and lifeless state is contagious. What is it that Christ declared about Laodicea? What state did Christ find Laodicea in? Complacent, self-satisfied, lukewarm. Thank you, lukewarm. I wish that thou wert cold or hot. What is Moab? Moab is cold. Right now, Moab is in a better condition than Laodicea. But what is Christ seeing here? They have not stood <clears throat> at their post of duty as faithful sentinels. Is this to be said of us today within this movement? Yes, if we're honest with ourselves, yes. Then what, what exactly does the next sentence say? Please read it. Would someone please they read this? Not cooperated. Yeah, they have not cooperated with the heavenly intelligences by exercising their God-given ability to do the will of God, pressing back the powers of darkness and using every power God has given them to advance truth and righteousness in our world. You know, and a verse that comes to me is examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And we need to have this daily self-examination and then we can be corrected of God. And when we're corrected of God, then we can hopefully correct others. I 
question to you is this. <clears throat> Can those that are not cooperating with the heavenly intelligences by exercising their God-given ability to do the will of God, can they be blessed of God? To me, that's a simple question. Can they be blessed of God <clears throat> if they are choosing not to cooperate with the heavenly intelligences? No. So my question becomes, what is our work today? We cannot be as Moab. We are not to be as Babylon. Babylon is confusion. If we are part of a cold and lifeless church, then we are like Moab. The admonition being given is that we are to stand at our post of duty as faithful sentinels. Did the sentinels cast people out? No, the sentinels gave warning of what was about to befall the city. The sentinels were warning the city to prepare to beware. The sentinels chose to cooperate with the ruler of the city. Under whose banner do we seek to stand today? Are we seeking to stand under the banner of Prince Emmanuel? Or are we seeking to stand under the black banner of the apostate? Choice A or choice B? There is no middle ground. The officers of the churches, the presidents of conferences are in need of being converted. The leaders of the movement are in need of being converted. Oh, how much a revival is needed in the churches. Variance exists. Many hearts are filled with envy, evil surmisings, and evil thinking. Evil speaking is heard. The Lord is ashamed to call the members of such churches brethren. Well, the question that I have, so we know that people need to be converted. So we know we're not converted. At least we should know we're not converted based upon how we act. But the real question is why would we not recognize the need for conversion? What is there about human nature that can justify the way we treat one another? Well, so maybe maybe self righteousness. Yeah. I mean, it's the great deception to think that you're all right when you're all wrong. So, you know, human pride comes in. It's a type of self-deception. Um, everything that we should be, all of our energies should be put towards uniting with Christ, changing our, our characters, and uniting with our brethren in the work that God has given this movement. 
Everyone should feel welcome. There shouldn't be the, the party spirit that exists. And the thing is, you can't change someone else, right? That's, that's the real problem, which is what we're always trying to do. The other person's the problem. Once they change, then we think everything will be okay. And, and so we have to figure out what it is about us that needs to change. I mean, we've said this many times. Only God can show us that. We come to God, He can show us our truth. We are to be willing to lay everything before God. We are to surrender all. The warnings that we are being given right now, the warnings of the sun and the moon and the stars are being seconded by the warnings that Christ himself had given that these things are occurring within his church. This is not a church <clears throat> where man has chosen a name. This is not a church with brick and mortar. This is to be a church, a temple of living stone. Can one stone choose as to which other stone is going to be beside it? The stones don't choose, right? Nope, they don't. All right. But the stones stand in unity. Right now, the work that is before us is that which is very personal. It is a work that is difficult. Taken in the strength and wisdom of man. It is the refiner's fire. The gold, the silver, never understands how much impurity is already within it. But the refiner does. How many times do we ask to be removed from that fire just before all of our impurities are removed? Oh, it's too hot. It's too difficult. It's too hard. Please take me out. Or just bypass the fire and bring me on the top of the mountain. Right. Did Daniel's three friends ask to bypass the fire? No. Uh-uh. What did they do? Did they not praise God while they were in the fire?
have we not the need to be able to praise yeah. God for all of the blessings that he is providing? We tend not to publicly praise him. We tend not to share with our brothers and sisters the great blessings that he is providing for us. Yet every day, every week, blessings are being provided. Answers to prayer are being received. That can and will encourage others. That the fire that is being seen all the way around us is not as severe as many might think. Comment from the chat is the suggestion that the three in the fire walked not by sight, that they walked by faith. Where is our faith today? Where is our praise today? If we are walking by faith, are we not walking and praising God for the blessings that he is providing? As many of you know, over the last several weeks, I've had to face what has been probably the greatest fear in my life, that I would go blind. When I had to go in and was told that I had another detached retina, I looked at the doctor and I asked God that his character might be glorified, not mine. I was operated on by a doctor that was a graduate of Walla Walla, that was a graduate of Loma Linda, that through all of this, identify as a Seventh-day Adventist. <clears throat> this doctor didn't want to tell me before the surgery how severe this detachment was. Because the retina was 75% detached from the rear of the eye. He didn't expect me to have more than 50% use of the eye. He didn't want to say that to begin with. I was not told that at my first checkup. I was not told that at my second checkup. I was finally told at the third checkup, six weeks after surgery, that you had a 75% detachment of the eye. We expected you to have less than 50% use of the eye. And we're shocked that you have greater than this. When my, comment, when my comment was made that this is all to the glory of God, the surgeon looked as if I had slapped him. And he was an, he was an Adventist? Yes. When I went to see the next specialist, because they wanted me to see this other specialist about two weeks after this, the specialist came in and he was very animated. 
He could not understand the surgeon's notes. He said they can't be right. There's no way this could be right. I have to see this for myself. He went through, he did the tests that he needed to have done. And he came back and he said, this can't be. Why? Your vision in this eye is 2060. People don't have that severe of a detached retina and come back with a vision this good. Again, I repeated that this is all to the glory of God. It is to his, it is from his will that this is done. This surgeon, not an Adventist, looked at me and he said, there are not many that would say that. He walked out of the exam room, shaking his head. This last week, I had a conversation with another sister. One of the comments that she had made was that she was about to go see doctors up, up in the area where she lived, that she could no longer come down to Spokane to be seen by the doctors. And I asked why. She said, now you knew several months ago that I had a problem. Yeah, I remember. You were in a, nurse, in a nursing home situation for a while. Because of a brain injury, she had been left with the inability to speak. She was having trouble walking. The doctors in Spokane that had seen her believed that she would have the need for 24 hour a day care for the rest of her life, that she would never again live on her own because her brain injury was so severe. The last time that she saw the doctors in Spokane, they told her, there's nothing that we can do for you. You are off the charts. We have never experienced something like this. Your recovery is nothing short of a miracle. Every day, we have reasons for praise. Every day, we have the reasons to be able to share our praise for what God is doing in our lives. Yeah, even, even the small things, you know, um, we can praise God for. Amen. Oh, man, they're important. How many times do we ignore the small things when it is those small things that may be used to encourage someone else? Mm -hmm. How else can we grow in faith if we are unwilling to praise God for the blessings that he is giving? How else are we to go forward? How did the apostles go forward? How did Paul go forward when others sought to stone him? How did Peter go forward when he was released from prison? Here is Peter knocking on the door where he knew others were gathered. Rhoda comes to the door. She thinks 
that this is Peter's ghost. She is so sure that he is now dead, that his ghost is now seeking admittance. Are we to ignore sharing these blessings or are we to proclaim this throughout the movement and thereby to the world of God's loving kindness and blessings upon us? Is this not the greatest way in which we can share our faith. Indeed. Letter 12, 1896. November 24th. I am somewhat rested this morning and I feel that I must write a letter to Brother Nobbs. I was apparently in your midst, speaking very much after the manner I have written to him. I've had the matter presented to me in regard to the work on Norfolk Island. There is more looking to the discouraging features and losing faith than looking to the Lord, the mighty power that he that is waiting our demand upon its abundance resources. The great day of the Lord is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, even the mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Zephaniah 1, 14, 15, and 18. The Lord that ruleth in the heavens is our God. We have made a covenant with him by sacrifice. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord come, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which hath wrought his judgments, Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's fierce anger. Zephaniah 2, 2 and 3. The Lord would have us increase our faith, faith and hope and reliance upon him. Faith, hope and reliance. Let us thank God that we have a refuge into which we may flee. We want more joy in the Lord. We realize his righteous, his mightiness to punish. We want to have a continually increasing assurance in his mercy, his love, his kindness and compassion to those who love and fear him. We want constantly the power, the fervor of the first love the fresh luster of his beautiful garments of righteousness. We are to show forth the goodness of God. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not on God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son, that he hath, the son hath life. And he that hath not the son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God, 1 John 5, 10 to 13. Please read the following, the two 
following verses. 1 John 5, 14, 15. Precious words, what a foundation we have in our faith. And let us stand securely. We have need to cultivate faith. Ever be cheerful. Consider these words. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. Would someone please read 1 John 5, 14, and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If we ask, we are to believe that he has heard. Is that not correct? Amen. Yet how many of us ask and choose not to believe? We are coming to the close of today's time together. It is important for us at this point to believe that what we ask of God in faith is going to be received and that it has already been received because God knows our needs before we do. What has been happening within this movement has been less of faith than it should be. When Elder Jeff began in 1989, he did not see that by 2019, it would be necessary for the Ministry of Future for America to present the warning that would soon befall Nashville. We are to have faith in the word of God. We are to have faith that our requests that are made of him are and will be answered if that is his will and they will be answered in his good time. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let us hold on to this. As we hold on to these precious words that John wrote, for these are for our admonition today. Any thoughts, questions, or comments at this time?
Um, just one comment, just dealing with um, uh, the story that you mentioned there about Rhoda. Yes. Um, so Rhoda knew it was Peter. It was the other people that she told that Peter was at the gate or at the door that they said it is his angel. Okay, I stand corrected. Thank you. Yeah. So she believed it was Peter. She was just so excited that she she didn't open the door for him. So. And I thank you for the message. Yeah. Today. Well, this is thanks to God, not to me. Yeah. The one thing, too, is, you know, I'm not really sure when it comes to encouraging other people how to do that. It's probably one of my weaknesses. Um, you know, so, you know, one of the things I recognize as a fault that I have is my inability to interact with other people in a positive way, other than to share the Bible. Um, I'm not really great socially. Um, and so, you know, I wonder about that failing of mine, if there's something that I can do about it. I've struggled though this with this my whole life. Theodore, the first time I met you was at the Robanskis, right? Yep. And that was how long ago? Well, it was 2017. So we're talking five years ago. Yeah. I have observed with you over the last five years, great strides in your interaction with all of us as we have been meeting through these studies. I'm getting better at it, you're saying. Yes, you're getting much better at it. Okay, well, that's good to know. And in your emails to Theodore. Oh, okay, well, thanks. So at this point, the the changes that have been occurring over these last five years <clears throat> have been noted the question that we each have are we growing as much as christ would have us to grow in our interaction with our other brothers and sisters yeah. Yeah, and it's especially difficult when you have conflicts. I think for me, it's been that's why. Oh, Sorry, go yes, ahead. You, you go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just saying uh, uh, after July 18th, I've been doing a lot of self examining <laughs> after that point. <laughs> for yeah, me. Which, which, and we all need to do that. The, the problem is, you know, to know when I, I've had the problem with conflicts. When there's conflicts, I, I don't really know what to do, how to interact with people. I just try to be the same person that I always am. Um, but, you know, we have conflicts in this movement. I don't think I've always dealt with those conflicts the best way that I should. But I did it the only way I knew how to, which is to be just open and direct. But, you know, when, when people don't no, want... No, I found that... What's that? Sorry, I didn't mean to. It's okay. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I found that when somebody is really angry with me, I want to, I ask them, "How have I offended you? Mm -hmm. Please tell me how it was." You know, like I want to know the specific things that they have an odd against me for. And sometimes, honestly, I don't even remember, but I'll validate them. I'll say, "I don't recall that." But if you're if you've reacted, if I've hurt you in that way, I am so sorry. You know. And mm. like uh, there's a poem, a part of a poem, it goes, oh, that God, the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. And if there's anything in that, if there's any value and the Lord is using them to correct me, even if they come at me with the wrong spirit. I mean, I had a horrible temper, horrible. It was homicidal. And the Lord has just gentle me down so much like now i take usually take more time to listen to people if there's something that they that i have genuinely sinned against them against the lord about if there's something like in my own stumbling bumbling way i didn't i didn't purposely offend them 
And then I'll try to admit to it. You know, I'll try to see the value in what they're trying to share with me. And I'll say, Lord, you're going to have to correct this area because I don't want to be a stumbling block to anybody. I have been in the past. I know that. I'm sure we all have in some way, even when we don't intend to. It's interesting that you would bring up the Scottish Bard because that's, that's an often quoted passage in my family. Och, the power, the gift to give us, to see ourselves as others see us. Well, I'm part Scottish. <laughs> so. Bobby Burns. Yes, Robert. Now, there are changes that are occurring with each of us. Some have been imperceptible, some have been huge. In this situation, I think all of us need to be more mindful of our need to encourage others. And that's part of the basis of this entire message today. Mm -hmm. Final comment from the chat. Christ walked with the disciples three and a half years, and the question is how much longer where the disciple <clears throat> where the disciples converting. I see a bit longer before they were fully converted. I guess I don't understand. Well, just how much longer were the disciples being converted? Okay. How long did it take? For them to be converted, fully converted. Well, they walked with Christ for three and a half years, and then they had 40 days with Christ, and they had 10 days where they needed to confess their sins to each other and praise God and learn so that the, the Spirit of God could be poured upon them. So, if there's no other comments, shall we close with prayer? Heavenly Father, we are weak through choices of our own. Our character is imperfect through choices of our own. Our attitudes repulsive through choices of our own. We thank you, Father, that you would choose to cleanse us, that you would choose to prepare us that you would choose to, to clothe us in robes of your righteousness rather than the rags of our own. Please direct us today. Please help us, Father, and guide us so that we may come into a clearer understanding of that which you would seek to do in our lives, that which we must be willing to allow to be done in our lives so that your character may be more fully revealed to this world. Direct us now, please bless us. For this we pray, for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.